Our first speaker today is Ram Ramanathan. Dr. Ramanathan is a distinguished professor at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography at the University of California, San Diego. And the person who should really be introducing him has just arrived. Bonnie, would you like to introduce Professor Ramanathan? <laughs> okay, I'll do it. In the 1970s, he discovered the greenhouse effect of chlorofluorocarbons and numerous other man-made trace gases and forecasted in 1980 that global warming would be detectable by the year 2000. He also led an international team that first discovered the widespread atmospheric brown clouds and showed that they led to large-scale dimming, decreased monsoon rainfall, and rice harvest in India and played a dominant role in melting of the Himalayan glaciers. His team developed unmanned aerial vehicles with miniaturized instruments to measure black carbon in soot over southern Asia and to track pollution from Beijing during the Olympics. He has estimated that reduction of black carbon can reduce global warming significantly and is following this up with a climate mitigation project entitled Project Surya, which will reduce soot emissions from biofuel cooking in rural India. Dr. Ramanathan is a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the American Meteorological Society, the American Geophysical Union, and American Academy of Arts and Scientists, Sciences. In 1995, the Royal Netherlands Academy of Sciences awarded him the Boyce Ballot Medal for outstanding scientific work in the science of atmosphere over the last decade or two. In 2002, he was awarded the Carl Gustav Rosby Research Medal for fundamental insights into the radiative roles of clouds aerosols, and key gases in the Earth's climate system. He was elected a member of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences in 2002, quote, for fundamental contributions to our modern understanding of global climate change and human impacts on climate and environment, and to the Pontifical Academy of Sciences in 2004 by Pope John Paul II. He was elected to the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences in 2008. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Romanathan. Good morning. Uh, I'm really delighted and honored to be your opening uh, speaker. <clears throat> so you can see that I, I'm starting my uh, talk not talking about climate change, but what we can do to solve them. It more sort of reflects my current st state of mind. I started working in this problem uh, mid or early 1970s. And I've written, you know, 200 papers. I'm disappointed each one of them brings one more problem we have to face. So it's about uh, 10 years ago I decided I have to stop doing this, take the knowledge we have gained so far, and try to look for how do we attack this problem. Not only point out how to do it, but really go to the field and do it. So this is what uh, I, I'm going to talk to you. But of course, I have to give you some scientific background. And so I'll start with that. Uh, so let's see what are the sources of uh, pollution which causes climate change. Of course, smokestacks. And these things put out gases. One of them well known as carbon dioxide. But they also put particulates. Automobiles, biomass burning, open burning. And agriculture, I may just so that itself, uh, that is a village I grew up in, and that's my grandmother's kitchen. I sat right there, enjoyed some of the best meals of my life, and uh, the sad thing is, this was not taken when I grew up, I took this picture two years ago. So let, let's uh, talk about first, why we are all connected, why should my grandmother worry about what car I'm driving in the US. Likewise, why should we here, this Denver, worry about what she is cooking with? She, she's not alive, by the way, so she's not cooking anymore. But uh, uh, so let's look into that. Take a close look at the next movie to see how strongly interconnected we are. It shows how fast uh, the atmosphere moves things around. 
It's not moving. <coughs> well, it's too bad. Movie is not working. Well, uh, what it shows is that uh, I don't know why it's not working. We, d we just tested it. Air from China moves in a less than a three to four days across into the US, carrying all the pollutants around. Likewise, we would see air from our East Coast moves in less than two to three days across Europe. And you would have seen vast amounts of biomass burning dive into the Antarctic in less than four or five days. Can you do that? Sure. Apparently, the mistake was mine. I, I, I didn't hit the S button for some questions here. And it still didn't do that. What is it supposed to do? Let's move to the next one. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. So. He de definitely deserves a big applause. <laughs> and so what we see here, you know, you can see the stuff moving, and you can see how air from central parts of Africa just going into the Antarctic. What really happens is that these gases which we put out surround the planet like a blanket, <clears throat> okay? Just think about carbon dioxide. Anything you burn, you know, becomes carbon dioxide. That's a carbon in the fuel. And tailpipe, all that comes out is CO2 and other pollutants. These things, once you release, where well, half of them stays for about 100 years. So this surrounds the planet like a blanket. Now, so let's talk about why should we worry about this blanket we are given the planet. We get planet. So the fundamental energy source for the planet is sunlight. About 28% is reflect back. So the planet then sunlight heats the planet. It gives off this heat as infrared heat radiation, okay? And that escapes to space. So this thing goes on until what comes in the sunlight leaves the planet as infrared or heat energy. And it's that infrared energy we have blocked by putting this blanket. If you ask yourself, how does the blanket keep you warm on a cold winter night? The blanket has no heat source. It just traps your body, traps your body heat. That's exactly how these gases behave. They trap the heat coming from the planet and heats the planet. It's really fundamental laws of physics and quantum mechanics. There's no way to escape it. Okay? There's no controversy about it. It's all experimentally determined. I, by myself, I'm an experimentalist. I don't believe in anything until I can touch it, feel it, or smell it okay, with my instruments. So let's understand how thick we have made the blanket. This was what I was curious when I was a postdoc in 1975, teamed up with a team of NASA engineers, designed this satellite instrument with telescope and measured the heat coming out of the planet. What we found, so the energy is we measure it in watts, same as we say 60 watt light bulb, meter squared or square meter of the Earth's surface. So that was what surface the Earth was giving out. What was escaping is about a third of that. That, by the way, is the blanket Mother Nature gave us. This is not the blanket we created. So without that, the dominant contributor to that blanket is water vapor in the atmosphere. It comes from the ocean, stays in the air, traps heat. Without that blanket, we know the planet would be frozen like Mars. So greenhouse effect by itself is not bad. We need it. What we have done is thicken that blanket. And we know that heating we have added from within 20% by measurements, spectroscopy, quantum mechanics. So we have made that blanket about 2.5% thick. How much would the planet heat up? And how soon? So that's where a lot of the debate and controversies are. It's not in the fact that we are heating the planet. There is just no doubt. It's basic physics. So. <clears throat> 
It turns out, we find out what are the pollutants which is trapping it. First is carbon dioxide. It comes from fossil fuel combustion, burning of forests. Okay? It turns out that's not the only thing. There are five other gases, pollutants, halocarbons, used as refrigerants. That was my work with discovering that greenhouse effect. Nitrous oxide comes from fertilizer use. Plants give, soil gives it out. Ozone, we think of it as a pollutant, which it is, but it's also greenhouse gas. And methane. Methane leaks out from natural gas pipes, from vegetation, from cattle, etc. So about 45, 55% is carbon dioxide, the remaining 45% is the other gases. So I'm going to make a forecast, and you would think it's absolutely crazy. So I need to establish my track record in making such crazy forecasts. So in 1980, I teamed up with the famous meteorologist Roland Madden. And he said, if our theory is right, when would we see this warming? Before that, see how we start these papers, the possible climate effects of large increase in atmospheric CO2 may constitute one of the important environmental problems of the coming decade. We were certainly not the first to say it. There are many, Roger Revell, Swante Arrhenius. So this has been known for at least four to five decades. Society, we have not been able to do anything about it. There's been a warning going on. But anyway, what we forecast, the predicted there, using a sophisticated statistical dynamical model, that if we consider all of the uncertainties in our model predictions, but if our theory is say, we should detect the warming by year 2000, okay? Unfortunately, that forecast come, came to be true. This is the global average temperature record of th thermometers around the planet, oceans and land. And it shows the warming from 80s temperature. Of course, it fits and bursts. And then since the 60s, it has steadily climbed. And it's only year 2000, the signal rose above the background noise. This is what we forecast. So next, using that, let me make the following, and I'll talk to you a little bit about that. My work has determined we have already dumped enough gases in the planet to warm it by two and a half. That sort of, for those of you not in, the, in this game, that is very discouraging because the Copenhagen Protocol, which President Obama championed, says, we should keep the planet's temperature under two degrees. How can we do that? We already put enough gases there, okay? So even if you reduce carbon dioxide, that's the main focus of all the global negotiations. My work suggests the warming will still exceed two and a half. We will, and the second thing which came in 2010, we will very likely reach this two degree warming by 2050. So this is not, some, many of us think climate change, 2100, 2200, we have to let our grandchildren, great-grandchildren worry about it. This is our lifetime. And I, I am sure, I see so many young students, Notre Dame would organize a conference like this 37 years from now. Some of you hopefully would say, I heard this in a conference here by a old guy was, we thought it was absolutely crazy. Okay. But fortunately, it's not too late. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about. We can still keep the planet's temperature thermometer under two degrees. So let's go back to that. So what I told you is that this, taking the heating and calculating this two and a half re requires a lot of machinery. It's basically saying, remember, the blanket has become thick. It's not allowing the heat to escape. So the planet has to heat up and restore that energy balance. Okay? And that shows all of our work is over 300 papers are buried in this. It takes about one watt per meter's forcing to heat the planet by 8 tenths of a degree Celsius. If you're used to thinking in Fahrenheit, just double it. You have to multiply by 1.8, but just think of this twice. So the, the three watts, the blanket has thickened, should heat the planet by about two and a half. The question is, so I asked, I answered the question, how large? 
Next question is how soon? Okay. So one thing you have to understand is that when I say two and a half, there is a tremendous uncertainty in our understanding of climate change. So the distribution of that, I focused on the central figure two and a half. It could be as small as about one, one to one and a quarter degree. It could be as large as four to six. When I sleep, I pray I am wrong. It is somewhere here, as the skeptics claim. Okay? And beyond this is not even thinkable because our society is not even ready to cope with something like this. A World Bank reports and things like that. What such a large warming means, I put together the various icons of the planet's climate system. One by one, they will go, into, go down. First is Arctic summer ice, which we know is already melting rapidly. Next would be the Himalayan. There is a wide range here. Glacier, Greenland ice sheet, the Amazon rainforest, so on and so forth. This is what science scientists are talking about. It looked like science fiction, but these hopefully is. Now you ask the question, wait a minute, how can it be two and a half? The planet has warmed only one third. What happened to the remaining two thirds? Either your theory is wrong or something is missing. So it turns out about half a degree, this comes from observations in the ocean. I'm from the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. We contributed to this in a big way, scientists at Scripps. We know about half a degree is still in the ocean, deeper parts of the ocean. And the ocean will spit it off in the next coming decades, two, three decades. Okay? The remaining half, we are still with half, what happens there? He said, these are the gases. Now I need to make the blanket a little bit complicated. Okay? I use the metaphor. Otherwise, this problem is too complex to explain. So that's the greenhouse blanket. There are gases and gases that should have heated the planet by two and a half. We are only seeing one third of it, eight tenth of a degree. And I told you about half a degree is in the ocean. So there's still about 50% left. So it turns out, by sheer dumb luck, as we are putting these gases, we are also putting particulates. We know that those who live in the cities, the haze. It, how does it come from? Sulfur dioxide from coal combustion gets converted to sulfates and sulfuric acid. And these are mirrors, white particles. They reflect sunlight. There are other substances, nitrates from cars, organics. So we have masked this warming. So think of this. Let's go back in time. Before Mr. James Watt, 1750s, nature gave us a nice blanket, and we were merrily going along. Here comes the dawn of industrial revolution. We started to burn fossil fuels in a hurry. Coal, oil, natural gas, dump these gases. The blanket gets thicker. Not as much heat is escaping. We are about to warm to two and a half. But it turns out our pollution, our technologies were weak. So we were putting this mask, the mirrors, the mirrors have reflected sunlight back and offset some of the warming. There was one more thing I have to complicate. Remember diesel combustion. What happens? You see this dark smoke. Or when you burn fires, you see the dark smoke. That is black carbon. It is dark because it's the most efficient absorber of sunlight there is in the planet. Remember, God gave us beautiful blue skies. And in polluted regions, the skies don't look blue. In fact, it looks brownish. That's why we call them brown cloud. That comes from this. So this heats the blanket directly, contributes to global warming. Okay? Think of it as smoke in the blanket. So complete the story. There's, we thicken the blanket, and we put mirrors. And now we also put smoke to heat the blanket. The mirrors cool, the smoke heats. It's at this point of my talk. Skeptics, I'm surprised no one has got up. We know this whole Ramanathan story is smokes and mirrors. Don't believe anything he says. <laughs> okay. So, in other words, we have good explanation for why the planet has warmed. But that's a Faustian bargain we have made. This mask is what causes acid rain. Kills millions. So we are cleaning up. So we are unmasking. Okay. So the warming would accelerate, and that's why we are seeing in the US and Europe, the warming rate is increasing. 
So now let's talk about what, how society is responding to this. What are we doing about the greenhouse emissions? You know, carbon dioxide emission, I don't know if you really how much we have, 40 billion tons. It's literally equal to tossing 20 billion cars in the air every year. And they're just staying up there, okay? And that 40 billion ton gorilla is still growing. In spite of all the things, remember some of the, my prediction came in 1980, the papers were written in 1960s, 50 years, nothing. The second thing is, what are we doing to the mass? See, the mass was this big. By the way, I visited Venice in 1987. I got fixated on the Venetian mask. And you can see sulfur emissions from the US, North America, going down rapidly. I'm not saying we shouldn't have cut the sulfate emission, but cutting it without realizing we are accelerating the warming was a mistake. So the mask is shrinking, which means that we are racing to the two and a half degree warming. So we are basically going the wrong way. The greenhouse gases are increasing. We are thickening the blanket. The cooling aerosols are decreasing. We are unmasking the warming. And we are adding more smoke, black carbon. The smoke in the blanket is thickening. Remember, the smoke, by absorbing sunlight, makes the blanket an electric blanket. It's heating more rapidly. So the whole, whole world is focusing on carbon dioxide. President Obama's group released a report two weeks ago. They focus on energy efficiency, alternate. We have to do all that. Believe me, I'm not complaining about that. But no, it's not understood very well. See, that is the carbon dioxide concentration simulated by our model. These are the emissions. You can see the emissions going rapidly. Even if I cut the emissions by 50%, which we need to do that, the CO2 is still growing because it's a gorilla with a huge inertia, okay? We cut it to 80%, this thing is still growing. Finally, it's leveling at 450, but we'd have added another one degree warming. We went from two and a half to three and a half, okay? So what is the solution to this mess? If we don't do anything, if we all decide Ramanathan is nothing but smokes and mirrors, let's keep going, that is the path we are going. We will hit in excess of four degree warming by 2100. This now the World Bank has agreed. They released a major report about the catastrophic consequences of hitting four degree warming. Okay? If we cut CO2, you would reduce it by a degree, but the relief in 2050 is not going to be there. We are exceeding two degree warming around the corner in our lifetime. Okay? So the only way to get out of this mess is to thin that blanket. How do you thin the blanket? Reduce the compounds who have lifetime of few weeks to few months. Black carbon lifetime is one week. So if we cut down black carbon today, they're gone two weeks from now. Their heating effect is gone. Methane, if you cut it 10 years from now, they're gone. So what we are suggesting is thin that blanket I'm calling it shortly climate pollutants. And then on, along with the CO2, you can see that you avoided the two degree warming by 2050, and you stayed at two, below two. We still, two is still a large warming, mind you. But at least we got to tell the society what to adapt to, okay? So there is a chance still to avoid catastrophic changes. So I'm just summarizing this reduce the rate of thickening. So we got to cut CO2. That still has to be first. Our grandchildren will benefit. Offset the unmasking. We, we will benefit black carbon ozone and thin the blanket. Our children will benefit. Okay? And the thing I want to mention, so I'm calling it short-lived climate pollutants. There are four of them. Methane, ozone, HFCs. HFCs are refrigerants, black carbon. So we do that. The black curve is when happens if you believe in the Ramanathan blanket smokes and mirrors. And the beauty is the mitigation of the short-lived climate, but we don't need rocket technology. We, we have technologies to do that. California cut its black carbon emission by 50%, just working on diesel filters. 
So you delay the disaster chain by about 30, 40 years until we figure out how to suck the CO2 out of the air. And, and here we are showing right now we have a 97 probability of exceeding 2 degrees in about 35 years. And we change it to 97% probability of staying below 2 degrees by working on CO2 and the climate pollutant. Basically, there's still time. And that is why conferences like these, purely interdisciplinary, are the critical for taking this on. So how did we go from science to policy making? I realized the reason people are not taking attention is no one can relate to a plant globe, global warming. We need to localize it, regionalize it. So we took it to Asia and understood what's happening at that local regional scale and released a report, Atmospheric Brown Cloud, focusing on Asia. It's an international team. I led this team, the Chinese, Japanese, Indians, Americans, Canadians, almost many nations participated. Then by then, it was around this time, a year before, I was honored with Pope John Paul, you know, electing me to his academy. I took it up that this is the forum I need to bring up. And fortunately, Pope Benedict gave us approval to organize this meeting, and it really caught the attention. Okay? After all, let's face it, scientists like me don't have a moral authority to tell people to change behavior, but religion do. And then later, UN caught on and formed this huge international committee that basically agreed with the projections I had made. And I'm especially proud, in the Pontifical Academy, there were three Nobel laureates, a top glaciologist in the world, and see what, what we agreed on the declaration. We are committed to ensuring that all inhabitants of this planet receive their daily bread, fresh air to breathe, and clean water to drink. As we are aware, if we want justice and peace, we must protect the habitat that sustains us, but stewardship and the believers among us ask God to grant us this wish. It was a very influential report. And the UNEP report basically confirmed my predictions, projections, but it pointed out, using the measures we used, you can save as much as two and a half million lives lost to air pollution, indoor and outdoor, and save hundreds of millions of tons of crop damages by ozone. So it had huge societal benefits in addition to controlling climate. Fortunately, Hillary Clinton and the Swedish minister took it up, and now they have formed a coalition. About 25 nations have joined. There is a lesson to be learned here, how to be effective in climate change mitigation. In, this is my speculation. I'm not a social scientist. I hear Dr. Gardiner is going to be there tomorrow. It would be nice to see what he has to say. The reason we got such rapid response, within two years of paper, it became 25 nations signed up. Public health, food security, benefits with materials in our lifetime. We are not telling them, please cut down your emissions so that you can save Greenland ice sheet 200 years from now. We're talking about around the corner. The effects are regionally concentrated. People who do the control would get to see it, et cetera, et cetera. So now, I want talk to you about how do we take this policy and implement it in the field. I knew I just, if I just left it with my scientific papers, they're just going to be there lamenting. People are interested, but they also know how to do it. Okay? The short-lived climate pollutants really requires bottom-up approach. And I want to give you one example. One of the major sources of black carbon, about a third of the black carbon emissions come from residential sector, cooking, lighting, and heating with biomass and solid coal. Sorry, this is not supposed to be there. This shows the source of black carbon, you know, black stuff, and that is the kitchen I'm going to take to. It's not my grandmother's kitchen. This lady, she's, a, you know, living in a village in Himalayas, okay? Let's go inside. And I said, do you know about the smoke? She said, yeah, it's in my house. I said, do you know that it gets outside? She didn't know. I took her outside. 
that was what coming out of her house, right in the foothills of Himalayas. And she was absolutely shocked. And, and I've done this with many, many rural women. And this is biomass burning. Okay? I mean, I've been in the villages the last two months. This I took about two weeks ago, documenting this. And I showed this woman there, as well as this fellow farmer, and showed him my satellite images. You think it was one year cooking. I told him about the population, multiplied it. It was amazing. I didn't feel any resistance. And both of them, sir, we didn't know. We were destroying the planet. I told him, not the planet, your local habitat. So over the last 10 years, we have documented it. So it's half a million deaths from indoor pollution. I've seen, I mean, it's, it's a, such a personal thing for me. I've seen my mother, I mean, grandmother. She'll cook from about 8.30 or 9 in the morning to about 10.30. Unfortunately, her house was filled with men. She had six sons and then two, three grandsons. Just imagine cooking firewood, and she'd be coughing for an hour and a half after cooking just to recover each day. I didn't realize it caused deaths. We also found the black carbon settling in the glaciers, so melting the glaciers was disrupting the monsoon because it's cutting down sunlight going into the ocean. So we formed this project, Suya. Okay, it's a scientific intervention project. I want to see if this movie would work. You know, basically. <laughs> It's two in the morning and Shabnam's kitchen is already buzzing. It's Ramadan, the holy month of fasting for Muslims. The meal has to be eaten before the break of dawn. At this unusual hour, Shabnam has a few unlikely visitors. Those are my research assistants. A group of researchers have to conduct an experiment in her kitchen. This effort they hope will make life a little better for rural women like Shabna. Shabnam lives in Kheratpur village located in the indo gangetic plains of North India. In an agricultural economy, most families here live on less than a dollar a day. There is little access to basic amenities, be it health, education or even electricity. Most girls drop out before completing high school only to take on the mantle of household chores. Shabnam spends several hours inside a smoke-filled kitchen. Inhaling the smoke puts her at a high risk of contracting diseases like asthma, tuberculosis and cancer. The suit on the walls is only a small reminder of what might be in the lungs of rural women who spend hours in the space. I have experienced this personally, you know, my grandmother. So it goes on, uh, sort of documents what, what we have done. And I uh, just want to talk to you about the health effects of the smoke. It was just released two weeks ago, and we used to think it was a million and a half, and now they find as much as three and a half million die, mainly amongst women and children, because they hold their little children, babies when they're cooking. Okay? And then some of it escapes to space. My own work shows two-thirds of the outdoor pollution in South Asia comes from indoor cooking. So 
obviously, uh, I, I want to point out at this stage, it's not something we used to blame these women are destroying things. The key is they have no energy access. You know, we have left a vast proportion of our society, three billion behind, with no access to water, with no access to energy. Okay? But this is a beautiful problem. It suggests that by solving their problem, we solve many other vexing problems climate change, agriculture impacts, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the angle we are pursuing here. So we started this as a scientific intervention problem. After all, I'm a, a physical scientist, teamed up with a major NGO, a brilliant rural intervention expert. So we started baseline monitoring inside the homes, every village home and outside, testing various intervention techniques, and then talking about dissemination and post monitoring. Okay, we have now done thousands. And I want to tell you this, uh, as a scientist, I was not convinced with these satellite images. I need to make the measurements. And the problem was, how do you measure in hundreds of homes? Each of my instruments costs about $250,000. So it was when my daughter, who graduated from Berkeley in wireless technologies, was boasting all the things she could do so during Thanksgiving, I told her, why don't you do something useful? <laughs> I told her about my problem. She designed, using cell phones, a way to measure this soot, which works within 10% of the $250,000 instrument. And this thing costs only 500. We were able to give the women to make the measurements. It had a huge impact on them. Anyway, what we documented, this is the black carbon concentration. For example, Chicago is one of the polluted cities in black carbon. That concentration is somewhere here in our cities on the bottom. These things are factor 100 large. And you can see when she starts cooking at 5.30, it shoots up. She finishes her cooking by 7, sends her children to school by 7.38, and then goes to the farm to work. OK? Goes down, and then she comes back around 6.30, goes up. In the meantime, mind you, she also have to travel at least half to one kilometer to get water. I mean, in the last two weeks, I, I, two months, I did not realize how much work is done by rural women. And we complain about them migrating to cities. Wouldn't you, if you're reduced to this? So, and you know, team, there are brilliant engineers in this team in India, so they found out this so-called forced draft stove with the gasified chamber brings down the black carbon concentration by 70%. So now we have a technology to solve the problem, okay? The question is, how do you scale it up? We've done it over 1,000 homes. The problems are these stoves are expensive, $70. And that's about roughly one month of their take-home pay. Would we spend a month of our salary on a cook stove? See, for example, if you go south of, in the US, about 40 degrees south, solar will power your home. The reason we can't do that is it costs about six weeks to two months of our paycheck. Who has that kind of saving? You know, when you're in the age group of under 50, you're busy sending your kids to colleges. Same thing with this woman. The same proportionality works. So the economies of scale, I can probably bring it to 50, is still too expensive. So what we are planning is using the climate angle to hook these women directly into carbon credits. Normally, carbon credits go to intermediaries. We have come with a way, again, this is the second Thanksgiving, I told my daughter to do something more useful. And she has come with a way to hook them with cell phones, with bags. And I want to take about five, 10 minutes to see how that works. So what we are distributing uh, is this uh, stove, improved stove, is $70, and solar lamps. See, the main thing that I hook the lamp is they use kerosene. And kerosene is a deadly source of black carbon or the pollutants. And it turns out for $25, our house is, has sufficient light. And the other thing is in the kerosene lamp, only two can study. So the typical family of five, the boys get to do the homework first. 
So this, four can sit around, okay? So it also has a few Don't get nervous, I'm not leaving with the thunder. My just thing came down. So uh, what we are doing is, uh, let me just describe that. So that, that's, Nithya, see she has put the sensor there. See the key problem in carbon credit is people cheat. She can just say, turn on the thing and say, I'm using it and get car. How do you verify it? So the verification is every star would be having the sensor. It's a 50 cent center hooked into her cell phone, and the data would come to my daughter's lab. She'll convert it to hours of cooking, and then I'll convert that to carbon credit in my lab. The key thing is distribution. Now I'm thinking of going millions, okay? So we are starting, starting this energy entrepreneur shops. I just opened this last week, helped open it. I had nothing to do with this. It's our NGO who created this. I was shocked. There were about 1,500 people who showed up. So people are ready, okay? But everybody said, we won't pay. That's $50 is too much. They're willing to pay about 1,000 rupees, which is about $15, okay? So we need to get the other 40. And the second thing is, we have set up this entrepreneurs. This is about 17 locations in Lucknow. Each of them serve a population of about 10, 50,000. And we have now about 51 energy entrepreneurs. They sell solar and they sell those cookstops. So we are ready to go. The second thing is banks. So this shows a particular CEO, one of the most innovative, aggressive guy. He says, I want to start tomorrow. So he is willing to give loan to at least 30,000 women. Okay? And the key thing is you, they don't give loan to an individual woman. There's no rules. We were not going to give them backing. All we said, we'll give them credits, provided the woman earn it, okay? So this is signed up. This is in the famous town of Varanasi, part of the indo gangetic Plains. The thing is, when you start dealing with money, how do you avoid corruption and all that? So we are teaming up with village leaders. These are all panchayat leaders to form so-called village oversight committee to have an oversight of this so that the money goes to the right hands. And lastly, people participate, you have to hear my lectures on global warming and sort <laughs> of this. Okay? And of course she's looking at me kind of disbelievingly, I've got worse problems than solving the global climate change problem. But she's the one of the ones first joined and, re and she really likes the stove because she shows where she used to cook. You can see the whole thing is black. She said, I used to be embarrassed getting visitors to my house. So she was able to buy it because her husband is in Dubai as a laborer. So she was, you know, I think they gave a little bit better pay. Um, but we are educating women like this. But the key thing is, Right now, I have created a climate mitigation fund within the University of California. I put my own money there, my uh, chair funds, so is about 25,000. And we found another 25 from UNEP. So we have $45,000, which means we can give carbon credit for 1,000 stops. Okay? And we want to demonstrate it, develop the protocols, and make sure the money doesn't go to the wrong hands. Once we are there, the voluntary carbon markets have agreed to sign up with us, in which case we will go global. So it will become a project. Anyone can say, okay, I'll buy carbon credit for Suya. Okay? So that's our approach. And, and this is sort of a schematic. We are doing this protocol so that it could be adopted by the world to scale up. All right? So, I told the bank's energy enterprise we created, I talked to you about the bank, they won't give the loan to an individual woman. So we have to form self-help groups. It's a groups of six to 10 women get together. There's peer pressure, I mean, there's a similar to the Grameen stuff, that's how it's done. So we have formed all this. I'm excited to say the whole stuff, and this is the money part. Okay, the data goes to my lab, my daughter's lab, she processes it, and then we get it at UCSD. I convert it into carbon credits. 
goes to the mitigation fund, then we give to the financial institution, they will then distribute the money to the individual woman. They all have accounts in the bank, okay? So uh, what's at stake here? This is my quid pro quo to them. You solve my grandmother's problem, I'll show you how to tackle problem warming, okay? There are three billion who have no access to fossil fuel, Saving hours of time lost, my cook stoves, no, I shouldn't say mine, the one we use, save about 50% in fuel. That's how we get carbon credit. We cut half the number of trees, okay? Remember, they collect one and a half to two tons per year. Just imagine carrying that much of firewood on your head, okay? Of course, it's over 365 days. Invariably, the woman, if she's busy collecting water, the girls do that. And I was there in this village, and I asked this girl, what is your brother doing? But she has a 13-year-old brother, and she doesn't say anything. Then we probe her that she, he's playing cricket. So the boys play sports. So I track him down in the cricket. He thought, I'm coming there to take video of this big game. <laughs> so I asked him, why are you not helping your mother collect the wood? And he says, I know, I help her more if I become a big cricket star, I'll bring in tons of rupees to help the family. So that is the sad truth. And it's all done by women and girls. And then in the environmental benefits are huge. We mitigate a billion tons of CO2 per year, just providing them cook stoves, providing deforestation, okay? And then another billion tons of CO2 equivalent through black carbon short-lived nuclear patterns. And it has been shown, at least half of the melting we are seeing is coming from the shortly pollutants. So just, this is a problem which has been waiting for a solution for a thousand years. I think the climate has become a game changer. And I want to tell you, in the shortly climate pollutants, it's just one of 20, 30 examples I can give you. Waste management, a lot of methane is lost, right? Cattle and uh, HFCs, there are replacement compounds. It's idiotic we are using HFCs. Uh, sorry, I have to be blunt. There are hydrofluorocarbons which has 100 to 1,000 times less effect on the, than the ones we are using. So there are just so many, many, many ways. And I just wanted to conclude you uh, with this summary, okay? You have to remember, if somebody says, cut CO2, of course, if you ask him, what is it going to do the climate change next 35 years? The answer is, not much. Then you ask, is there something else we can do? 80% would say, not much, because they're not familiar, even in my own field, about this other short-lived pollutants. You have to reduce emissions of these to protect ourselves in the next 30 years. But at the same time, you have to start the CO2. The CO2 reduction, if we don't start now, we have certainly lost the game because of its long lifetime, it's a cumulative effect. Whereas the short lived, it's an instantaneous effect, okay? So we have to do this without taking our eye off the ball of this 38 billion dollar ton gorilla. And I wanted to mention to you, uh, I'm not stopping it there. Uh, we teamed up with uh, a well-known development economist, Partha Dasgupta. He is a chair professor at Cambridge University, last 40 years, and Archbishop Roman Minarath and myself. We proposed to the Pontifical Academy, we should organize a far-reaching conference, put this whole thing in this sustainability domain of sustainability humanity and sustainable nature. And I'm pleased to say uh, that this was proposed under Pope, Pope Benedict. He agreed to address us, and the Pope has changed, as we know, and I am waiting for, the academy is trying to wait, create an opportunity for me to talk to the new Pope to persuade him to open this meeting, but address it, give a one-hour talk. 
So this is really going to address the issues of food, health, and energy. And, and, and I'm really looking forward to that, just like the other pontifical report got this SLCPs going. I'm hoping that this report would keep us, bring the whole climate mitigation back on track. Thank you so much. Oh, yeah. Oh, there you go. Okay. Um, your talk is fascinating. Um, it's also, for me, it was a bit counterintuitive to the climate justice story that I'm used to hearing, which is that the perpetrators of climate change are largely us here in the West, and the victims of climate change are those in the developing world, and particularly the women. And so the counterintuitive part for me is that here we are asking what I've perceived to be the primary victims to do the bulk of the work. And I realize that, that, that uh, nevertheless, it would still have great benefit to them. But what I'm trying to wrap my head around is the pitch for this story, could it be um, uh, misconstrued or, uh, or used for ill by those of us in the West who want to do nothing? Like, well, we, we could have Keystone. We just let the women in India do what they need to do. They should cure climate change, and we can go on business as usual here. So how do we? Um, navigate that, that difficult problem? Uh, I mean, it's a brilliant question uh, because you don't know, you walked into a landmine and that's exactly what I am asked by uh, NGOs in India, Bangladesh and others. So you are trying to put this all on these women and distract attention from carbon dioxide, okay? It's really a moral, ethical question, definitely a climate justice question. There are two things I, 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 I want to address it as, uh, as, is that first, the issue of cook stoves and village water, we have left them behind with nothing for centuries. So if I can use the climate angle to get them climate credits so that they can afford these stoves, so they walk half as less, work half as less, and not lose their children or young women, I honestly don't care about the politics. Let people say what they want. I can stand by my science. The second is, um, I'm hoping, but this is a foolish hope, is that if I, through this carbon credit, spreads to over, say, a few million, I'm thinking I can come back to the U.S. and tell my fellow citizens, if women in India can do this, do you think we cannot do this? We can do it too. We can protect the climate and benefit ourselves. So that's the story there. Protecting climate protects us individually. Well, I also wanted to thank you for your very inspiring talk. Um, but I'm afraid I also wanted to ask kind of a critical question. So you mentioned the Grameen Bank and other micro-lending institutions as the kind of intermediaries between the carbon credits and the women in these villages. One of the common criticisms of micro-lending institutions is that they charge interest rates that by our standards are usurious. Um, and so I'm wondering basically what kind of cut these intermediary financial institutions are taking off of the carbon credits. And if 
we're talking about maybe a 25% or a 50% cut, then maybe we should consider alternative kinds of financial arrangements um, so that these women are getting more of the economic benefits of the work that they're doing. Good question. Um, as you know, I'm a physical scientist. When I got into this three years ago, and the Grameen Bank approached me. I was shocked at the interest rates. Honestly, I would not buy. If my credit card charged me that much interest rate, I would tear it up. It is so high. So uh, that was just, to me, a no-no. Uh, here is a mainly rural government India banks, and the interest rate is 10%. It's an unheard of interest rate, but I don't know if it's sustainable it's for these 2,000 homes. <clears throat> and uh, what I teamed up with the social scientist, you know, she and I wrote this paper in Foreign Affairs that got Hillary Clinton reading about this uh, shortly of climate value terms. So we are writing an article in a, it's called SSIR, Stanford Social Something, how impact investor, investors, private foundations, and social entrepreneurs can get into this game and change it. And getting into this game means not giving them money, giving them this interest money, the same interest you and I get if you go to a bank. And uh, so that's what, yeah, I mean, the, the kind of interest rate charged by the Grameen type banks just won't work here. They're just too large. And we are basically, I'm working my head off by paying these banks and not benefiting the woman. The whole idea in our is, the game changer is, make the user see the benefit. Same thing if we bought a, you know, a car or, or a system and if we got tax benefit, then we would do it more. So that's the idea we are exploring. We are not there, but for the initial participants of 2,000 homes, the interest rate is given by the government of, rural bank of government of India and the loan they are giving is 10%. <clears throat> Good morning. Thank you very much for the, for the talk. I'd like to continue um, with the... Can you speak a little bit louder, please? Okay. Hello. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. So thank you very much for the talk. It was great. And I'd like to continue a little bit with the question that Deborah asked about asking um, the developing world to leapfrog into greener technologies, which I think is important because also has health issues. But my question is, is a bit more simple. How much of that emissions come from developed world? How much of the black uh, carbon comes from the US? And because I know we, we are supposed to have filters, particle filters, to, to take out much of that. But are we doing something? Can we do much, something more? Thank you. I should have pointed that out. Uh, it may come as a shock to the audience. The per capita emission of black carbon is larger in the US than in India. We are also big time black carbon emitters. So I didn't think of it as a poor man's issue at all, poor man's emission. Methane, we are probably about, you know, larger, even in terms of absolute amount than India, okay? So it's certainly not a developing nation problem. What I'm trying to do is because I was exposed to this cook, -ish, cook stove issue from my grandmother's time, I'm focusing on this in part because about two thirds of the outdoor pollution in India comes from the cook stoves. So the local benefits are huge. That's what I emphasize when I talked to you. I was just joking, I was telling this woman about global warming. I was more talking to her about health issues, disrupting the monsoon, disrupting the glaciers, etc. So uh, HFCs, you know, we use more refrigerants than anybody else in the planet. So, yeah, thank you for clarifying that. I don't have all the numbers involved, but we are a major players in the short-lived climate pollutants. I should have given that answer to that other uh, scientist who asked me, are you turning attention away from the US into India? No, not really. <clears throat> Our black carbon emission from diesel is huge. <clears throat> and also open burning and fireplaces. 
barbecues, I'm not saying we shouldn't barbecue. I'm just giving a fact. I think, yeah, there we go. Um, yeah, I want to go back to the first part of the talk. I thought that was very interesting about how much CO2 is in the atmosphere and the blanket and everything and the warming. But uh, as I understand what you've been talking about in terms of the project, that will reduce our amount of carbon we're putting into the atmosphere in the long run, right? But in the short run, there's still a lot of it in there. So how are we going to prevent the global warming that is going in the short run to increase us above two and a half to, or three to three degrees? Do you have any ideas about your more of a short run strategy for reducing the amount of carbon in the atmosphere? Yeah. Um, I think, you know, like I said, uh, again, if you go back to the blanket analogy, the blanket has become thicker by two and a half. Cutting down emission of CO2 is not going to thin that blanket. Okay? It will only prevent it from thickening. So, uh, on the other hand, if you don't cut that emission, we are leaving a disaster for our future generations. I don't think I am doubting that at all. I mean, uh, one thing I didn't even talk about, a global scale disaster, everyone focuses on sea level rise, acidity of the ocean. That, you know, we don't even understand what it's doing. But if we don't do anything by end of the century, you know, the CO2 concentration will go to 1,000 parts per million. And, and not clear if how much life would be left at that kind of acidity. So we, short, cutting shortly climate pollutants is not going to do anything about the acidity if we don't cut CO2. So I hope that message came across. All I'm worried about is people seem to be blind or oblivious to the fact there is a disaster down soon, and you don't seem to be thinking about that. Our eye is on the 2200 time frame, and we are losing track of some disasters down when, and that will definitely attack developing society or within our society those who are poor. Okay, so that's what I'm working on. And so that's my bias. I'm also selfish. I don't know if I live for 35 years, but I don't want to see disasters before I pass away and I feel such a total failure. We tried this for 50 years, nobody listened. So I want to make that clear. As for us, what can we do? Can we even cool the climate by anything to do with CO2? The only way we can do that is figuring out how to suck that CO2 out of the air, so-called sequestration. There are some geniuses who are trying it, but I just want to give them this one statistic. Do you know how much CO2 we have put in the air? One trillion tons. That's how many CO2. I'm just thinking the massive amount of mountains we have to create to take that CO2 out. Okay? People claim they will pump it into the ocean. I haven't seen any of them working. So I, if, if I see something working, I would change my tune. That's the way to thin the blanket, get that CO2 out of the air. You know, I see we're not able to get rid of our garbage in San Diego. You know, our garbage dumps are piling up. I'm thinking this, that, you know, a trillion tons of CO2 is equal to 500 billion Toyota cars. I have a Toyota, so I just think in terms of a Toyota car. I don't know where I'll buy 500 billion cars. Let's end on a positive note. I didn't want to end on that note. <laughs>